All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Megan Naola Heath. I'm the marketing manager for the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. And hopefully you're in the right place. We have a webinar tonight about um, the 2022 Cameron Peak post-fire restoration plans. And uh, we have a great group of partners together tonight to uh, give you all updates on what we have planned for this season uh, within the Cameron Peak burn area. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. Um, I will be um, recording this webinar and it will be available tomorrow on our website, pooterwatershed.org and also on our social media. Um, so please check that out if you would like to send the recording to a friend, family, colleague, or you just wanna watch it again. Um, it's going to last approximately an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. We have a lot to cover. So um, you're, of course, welcome to leave at any time, but we um, have, have time for a built in for a discussion at the end. So please put any of your questions that you have into the comment box uh, and we will get to those questions at the end. And last but not least, if you can please stay on mute during the webinar, um, that would be helpful for our presenters. Um, and just a shout out to um, all of our presenters who are joining us tonight and um, great partners um, that we've been working with for many years. Um, thank you all for being here. And I'm going to pass it off to Jen Petrozalka from City of Greeley to get us started. Good evening, everyone. Um, just give me a second to pull up my presentation. Can you guys see the presentation? Yes. So my name is um, Jen Da. I work for the city of Big Greeley as the water resources operations manager. And I've really been um, working on behalf of Greeley for the Cameron Peak fire recovery efforts. Um, so as Megan mentioned, this is really to, um, to tell, let us tell you about what our plans are for 2022 and what you can expect. We will briefly touch on the work that we did in 2021. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the funding issues that we've had and the funding that we have received. Um, then we'll go through the different project statuses um, of work that we're trying to accomplish for 2022. Um, in 2021, we did get a lot of work done. We spent about $17 million um, doing quite a bit of aerial mulching and then also some localized point mitigation projects. Um, and with that, I'm gonna jump into my presentation. Um, so we really have put a lot of effort into looking for funding so that we don't have to impact our customers financially. And some of the funding we've received so far is through the NRCS Emergency Watershed Protection Program. Um, this is limited to work that protects life and property, so we can't do things like repair roads, uh, maintain transportation facilities, and it doesn't cover any operations or maintenance that is needed. It is also not typically allowed on federal land, so for those of you who don't know the can. Sorry, sorry, Jen, I, I, um, I think you accidentally got muted there. Can you repeat what you just said and unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Um, yeah, so I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Sorry about that. Okay. We heard until federal land, Jen. All right. So this is uh, funding is typically not used on federal land, which the Cameron Peak fire um, did primarily burn on Forest Service land, about 90% of it. So we've been limited in how much work we can actually do with this funding. It does also require a 20% cost match. Um, Greeley has been the sponsor um, actually leading the grant but we've also received financial contributions from Fort Collins and the Tri-Districts to help us meet this 20% cost match. 
We've also received funding through the Colorado Water Conservation Board. Um, this funding is a little more flexible. It can be used on private and federal lands. Um, it can be a little, take a little while to get a contract executed after you put in an application. So you really have to plan ahead and you're limited by how quickly they can move on their end. And this funding does require one-to-one -one match. So for every million dollars that you receive, you have to match a million dollars. They are flexible in um, how that match can be met. You can meet it with, say, funds that you spent on other projects in the fire, like through the Emergency Watershed Protection Program. And then we've also received funding through the US Forest Service. Um, this obviously can be used on Forest Service lands, but we are limited on the types of work that can be done um, per Forest Service regulations. And it does require permitting and approval for any work that we wanna do. So we've had to work really closely with the Forest Service um, and they've been great at working with us to get um, quite a bit of work approved there as well. And just to emphasize again, um, the number of partnerships that have been required to successfully recover from the fire. You can see in the green box, um, Fort Collins, Greeley, the Forest Service, NRCS, um, just a whole bunch of partners that have really come together to um, work on this recovery effort. And the coordination is really being led by the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. They're the nonprofit that formed after the High Park Fire that are putting on this webinar for you all. Um, and they've really been great at hosting regular coordination and planning meetings with all the partners. Um, as I mentioned, Greeley is leading some of the grants as well as CPRW in Larimer County. And we're all working together to meet those cost match requirements. And with that, I'm gonna pass it off to Colin Berry. He's gonna talk about um, some of the point mitigation work that we've got planned. Awesome, thanks, Jen. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Oh, no, I haven't pressed the share button. There we go. And now, nice, good thumbs up. All right. Hi everyone, my name is Colin Berry. I'm a geomorphologist at a consulting firm in uh, Fort Collins. So that basically what that means is I'm, I'm a geologist who specializes in rivers and I've been working in the post-fire environment in Colorado for the past five years. Um, today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit, of, uh, go over a little bit again about what Jen talked about, um, programmatic overviews. Uh, then I'm gonna show you an online map resource um, that you can use during and after this meeting to kind of check out where these projects and where uh, we have prioritized watersheds of need. And then I'll go into just some photos about like what types of work we will be focusing on in 2022 and how to contact us, uh, not only if you've experienced kind of a threat to private property now, but if you continue to experience that during runoff events uh, this year. Cool, so as Jen said, a ton of people have been working on these projects in the Canopy Fire, right? From you all private property owners to local governments, um, to federal agencies, NRCS, EWP program, as well as US Forest Service to nonprofits like the coalitions uh, in the Big Thompson and Poudre River watershed, state agencies, CDOT is doing a lot of work and we'll talk a little bit later about what they're doing, Colorado Parks and Wildlife, um, volunteer groups, and then CSU as well. So we've all kind of been working um, to hopefully combine efforts and, and help in this long-term recovery, long-term and short-term recovery. There's a lot of different whys to these different counterparts and it creates a confusing dynamic. Um, so EWP is focused on uh, private property assets at risk, as Jen was talking about. The local municipalities are obviously concerned for private protection, private property and property owners, as well as water resources. So Greeley has high mountain reservoirs, as well as uh, water rights in the Poudre River. There's intakes downstream. There's county roads that we're concerned about. The coalitions uh, are primarily focused on water quality and community impacts. How can we look and make sure we secure these streams and watersheds long-term health in the future? And then the Forest Service is obviously concerned about um, you know, long-term Forest Service recovery, forest access, and, and infrastructure. So there's a lot of different mandates. There's a lot of different responsibilities, but we are working together to find that overlap and uh, be as efficient as possible in addressing needs. So what are we concerned about post-fire, right? We're concerned about three major things post-fire. Uh, hill slope erosion is the main one, right? How do we keep this newly 
burnt and mobilized sediment that has no roots and no vegetation protecting it anymore? How do we keep that on the hills, out of our streams, um, you know, damaging aquatic species, damaging aquatic habitats, uh, and impacting our water resources? We're concerned about stream incision, right? We get a lot more flows post-fire, and that causes our streams to adjust, causes our streams to erode, and damages valuable riparian systems, um, and creates this potentially long-term degradation in our streams, not only in the Poudre River, but our valuable streams um, kind of tributary to the Poudre River and the South Fork of the Poudre River. And then finally, we're worried about, uh, finally but not least, we're worried about damage to assets and damage to infrastructure. How can we make sure that people can evacuate safely during large storm events? How can we make sure they can access their properties? How can we protect their structures um, following the large increase in flow, following a fire? Um, so really just protecting infrastructure post-fire during post-fire flooding. Uh, lastly, there is always going to be events like this photo for Black Hollow. Obviously, I'm sure you guys are uh, very aware of this. These are the types of events that unfortunately our mitigation is not likely going to solve, especially the point mitigation. There's some rain events that just overwhelm our systems, especially the year one and two uh, following recovery. And so it's important, um, as I'm sure everyone will say, and as you talk to folks around the community, Pay attention to evacuation warnings, sign up for the NOCO alert system through LIDA, um, and just stay aware of where you are in our surroundings. Our biggest threatening months are anywhere from June to September during those large thunderstorm type of events. And those are the events that we're really concerned about. It's obviously very concerning in the next couple of weeks following runoff when the streams kind of swell and overwhelm their banks following a fire. Um, that is scary. It's going to transport material. It might inundate and potentially uh, cause some flooding in some areas. But the real damage and the life-threatening events are these thunderstorm events uh, from anywhere from June to September. And so we want to make sure everyone continues to be alert, even if we identify your watershed or uh, approach you for mitigation. Um, we're really trying to focus on making sure people stay as safe as possible. So Jen already went over this. Really, this slide is just talking about there are a ton of different funding agencies with uh, the ability, different goals. And right now in our 2022 of this last column, we're working to combine all of these efforts um, for more of a mid, middle to long-term recovery effort. Um, so how can we combine the, the needs of the federal agencies sponsoring work on private land with the Forest Service uh, funding that will be provided, uh, as well as with uh, nonprofits like Co uh, Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed and Big Thompson Watershed Coalition? How do we combine all these, make sure we're coordinated and efficient as possible? Cool. So um, in this recording, this is the link to an online map that I'll be showing here in a little bit. Um, I just wanted to encourage all of you to use this link whenever possible. Um, and here is, can everybody see this map on my screen? Great. So this is kind of just an online mapping software. There's a lot of information here um, and it is interactive. So we can kind of zoom in. Abby is going to talk about these beautiful colors on this map and how that kind of correlates to watershed prioritization um, kind of and how it kind of helps us identify areas that we need to step in and hopefully protect structures. If we zoom into any of these locations, it gets a little clearer and we can zoom in on different polygons. So the green dots are identifying projects for CDOT that we'll be working on the summer. We have some red dash lines and some yellow dash lines that correlate to our EWP projects this year and next. Um, then we have some large blue polygons which show completed mulching areas. So there's a lot of information here. We have streams and roads throughout our system. All of this is kind of combining to form a nexus uh, that's helping us make decisions and protect property owners. So there's obviously a lot to go through here. Um, I don't wanna overwhelm anyone on this call but I would encourage everyone to use the link um, provided here and it obviously will be available in the recording to explore this map at their own leisure, um, reach out to folks via projects, um, and hopefully we can answer any questions that you might have. Colin, do you mind dropping that link right now? Yeah, no problem. Or just after, that's yeah, okay. that's great, thank you. Yeah, I'll do it right after my talk. Yeah, perfect, thank you. Yeah, of course. So what kind of things are we doing? Um, and this is just examples from the 2021 mitigation. We'll be doing similar types of efforts um, in the 2022 mitigation. I'm gonna probably ring off a few sites that we've completed and sites that we're gonna be focusing on 2022 efforts. Um, but don't, I will say as floods, potentially occur this summer, feel free to reach out. EWP is a program that is, uh, and everyone here is particularly concerned about just protecting folks and helping them recover. So if things change at your property or adjacent to your property, please reach out and let us know. Sometimes it's hard to keep track of all the things happening in the canyon. Um, and we can 
orient you or help you get connected with the people who can help. So we're installing things like log jams to kind of create natural deposition zones and keep the sediment out of the Poudre River as much as possible. This is at Dry Creek, um, right near Arrowhead Lodge. We're installing wetland mitigation. So we're installing wattles up by Little Beaver um, on Pingree Park Road. That's where this is located to kind of help these wetlands recover long-term because existing depositional areas are our greatest ally in keeping sediment out of the Poudre River. We're installing rock channels using native rock to help these streams not in size. That picture I showed you earlier, this is at Norman Fry Road in the Sheep Creek watershed. So how can we make sure that these streams are protected against kind of a large erosion events? This is in Black Hollow watershed upstream of Daniel Bond's property on Black Hollow Road. Um, so again, we're installing um, storage, right? So these checks when originally installed were about three feet above the bed. They have now completely filled in. Um, so we have stored quite a bit of sediment in this area. Um, so again, it's not reaching the Poudre River and we're hoping to, we're going to vegetate these areas as well so they have long-term stability. We're doing road improvements for access. This is again on Norman Fry Road. So we have constructed crossings that are designed to overtop during large events. And then uh, water bars on the left here, which take water off of our road and put it back into the creek so we don't get damage to our road systems. And then we're protecting structures, right? We're guiding water away from structures when we're too close and then letting it do what it needs when we are kind of in safer areas. So we have muscle wall on the left here, protecting mixed structure and then barrier bags on the right, keeping, uh, keeping water off State Highway 14. Cool, so this is just a handy link. Um, these phone numbers and website will allow you to contact some folks who are uh, a, a public outreach firm that we're working with, who will help us direct you wherever needed um, or help you get um, the, the help you need. So uh, you can scan this QR code to get more information. This phone number will allow you to leave a message and provide helpful information. And then this, this email address will allow you to uh, reach myself and um, others on our team and we will direct you to wherever needed. So. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass this to Abby and she will explain more of that prioritization and mulching. Um, and so we just really appreciate all your guys' help and willingness to accept us into your community and um, you know help us get uh, this funding out to whoever needs it. So thank you so much. And I'll drop that map link in the chat right now. Thanks, Colin. That was a really great overview. Um, yeah, so my name is Abby McNamara, and uh, I work for JW Associates. I'm a watershed scientist, um, and we've been working with CPRW and cities of Greeley and Fort Collins for a long time now. Um, and th this piece of our work is um, the watershed hazard assessment, which Colin mentioned. Um, this has helped us with prioritization for... Um, Sorry, I <laughs> had to change my video because I could see more. Um, so for the prioritization for these um, mitigation efforts, um, including those EWP projects, some of those as well as mulching. So I'm gonna talk about that hazard assessment first and then I'll talk a little bit about mulching. So um, this hazard analysis in, um, includes four different components. The first component is soil burn severity. So the US Forest Service um, compiles a burn severity map as quickly as they can following wildfires. Um, and that is really useful for all of us to start planning for these mitigation efforts. The problem with Cameron Peak was that it burned so late in the season that a lot of it was put out by snow, as many of you know. So um, their aerial imagery that they were able to um, use following the burn had a lot of snow in it and they couldn't see the ground very well. So this was the first map that they um, put out following the wildfire. And um, a lot of it was really pretty good in the Pooter, but you can see down here in the Big Thompson, there's some big areas of land that they, they clearly couldn't see the ground very well in the aerial imagery. So they made their best guess and did their best. But um, when we were out in the field last year, we found a lot of places that were not accurately um, portrayed here in the burn severity map. So we were talking to the Forest Service and they, um, they were able to create a new mapping um, for 2021. So here's that map. It definitely looks a lot better um, down there in the Big Thompson. Shows some of those high burn severity areas. Um, oh, I should orient you real quickly. So the green here is unburned. Yellow is low burn severity. Orange is moderate and red is high burn severity. Um, so they 
they categorize soil burn severity into three different categories. Um, but while, while they were making this second map, um, we had been talking to some researchers at CSU um, because we weren't sure if the Forest Service was going to be able to um, put together a new map. So the CSU people were able to put together a DNBR map. That stands for Difference Normalized Burn Ratio. And it's just a metric that you can get from using different aerial images um, in order to identify burn the burn severity on the ground. So the nice thing about this DNBR is it gives us quite a bit more information um, in terms of the scale that we can use to identify different categories of burn severity. So we like this just because um, we do like that more detailed information that we can get for our hazard analysis. So this is what we decided to use um, for 2022. So that's the first component, the DNBR. The next component is um, a gross hill slope erosion. The Colorado Forest Restoration Institute runs a model for hill slope erosion following wildfire. And um, they were able to run that model again using the new DNBR data. The third component is the debris flow hazard. Um, so that's also a model, it's from the USGS. And um, we also re-ran that again using the new DNBR data. And what that model gives us is a likelihood of debris flow occurrence following a certain rainfall event. So we ran that model across the entire burn scar for the same rainfall event. So we're able to rank the watersheds relatively. The last component is a roads composite score. Um, Colin mentioned roads a little bit, um, but they're really important in terms of post-fire impacts because they tend to channelize the stream flow. So as the storm falls on the watershed, um, the, the runoff is going to go somewhere and roads tend to be really good stream beds um, when it comes to runoff. So they channelize the flow, which increases the peak flows, and they also bring a lot of sediment with them. And not to mention they're really important infrastructure um, that is important to protect in a lot of areas. So these are our four components for the hazard assessment. So we take each of these components and we rank them relative to each other. So each watershed gets a relative score. There's not a numerical value associated with that. It's just um, how hazardous that watershed is in terms of each of these components. And then we combine all four of them and come up with a composite hazard score. So that's what this map shows us. So um, here our watersheds are outlined here in the dark blue. These are seventh level watersheds. So they uh, run about 500 to 2000 acres in size. Um, and then this green, bright green um, outline here is the wilderness area. It's been really difficult for us to do any mitigation work in wilderness. So I wanted to put that on the map just to show you why we're not focusing on certain areas that, um, that pop up as red or orange. The blue polygons here are the mulching that we were able to do last year in 2021. And then there's some green, bright green polygons that are harder to see. Um, <clears throat> there's some down here in the Big Thompson um, that you can see a little bit better. Those are the EWP projects that Colin was mentioning from last year. So um, this is our new 2022 watershed hazard rank. The watersheds in red have the highest hazard rank. Orange is high, and then it goes down to green being the lowest. Um, so this is our preliminary map here. And um, in order to prioritize our work for 2022, we wanted to add in a couple of different components based on the work that we did last year so that we could get more watersheds rise to the top um, for the highest and high hazards. So we used that watershed hazard analysis as our baseline. And then we added in the EWP point mitigation projects that Colin was talking about. Um, the goal is to combine the mulching efforts with the point mitigation efforts. That just gives us a better overall treatment effectiveness. So we increase the priority for any watersheds that have also have point mitigation efforts. And then, like I said, we did mulching last year in 2021. We don't need to mulch those areas again. So we decreased the priority for um, watersheds that we've already mulched. So this is the map we come up with, all the same color schemes, but this is the composite watershed priority now. So this ranking is just in terms of where we wanna look um, to, to implement some of these treatments. So we look for groups of watersheds in the red and orange colors. Um, the reason for that is that it just um, helps us 
effectively use the dollars that we have because we don't have to be moving around the burn area quite as much if we can treat a whole group of watersheds in one place. And then it, it's also a compounding effect, right? So if you have a bunch of watersheds in the headwaters that are really hazardous, that, that hazard is just going to compound downstream. So I'm going to quickly go through the priorities that we have identified for 2022. So first off on the Pooter side, we have um, this first priority is going to be the Ratville and the South Fork area. Priority two is going to be Upper Bennett Creek right here and then the um, Upper Sheep Creek right here just to orient you is this is black hollow where we had that large debris flow last year um the yellow line is uh colorado 14. priority three is going to be the upper headwaters of the pooter west of 14. and then the fourth priority is this is upper elkhorn creek on the big thompson side um, our first priority is this upper miller fork drainage the Miller Fork uh, runs down to the North Fork of the Big Thompson, and that is an important source for the water supply for the city of Loveland. So that's priority number one. Number two is the upper headwaters of Buckhorn Creek um, and then Cascade Creek. Priority three, this is the North Fork of Fish Creek and Upper Sheep Creek. And then priority four is this is Stringtown Gulch and Bear Gulch. So that was a quick overview of our prioritization. And now I just wanted to talk about mulching briefly and um, why do we mulch and what is it? So um, Colin mentioned also that we, when we lose all the vegetation following wildfire, um, that increases the speed of the water running down the hill slopes, um, which picks up soil uh, and adds to erosion. So the goal of mulch is to keep that soil on the hill slopes and reduce the erosion. And the way that it works is that it adds this texture to the soil and slows down the water as it runs downhill. Um, it allows the water a little bit more time to infiltrate into the soil. Um, this reduces peak flows and storm runoff, which can be a really important contributor to debris flow initiation. So while, uh, while we're not um, claiming that we will completely erase the hazards with this mulch, it's definitely going to help um, with all of these with all these pieces. So the last piece that it does is it aids in vegetation recovery by keeping the soils moist and cool after rainfall. Um, and I like to think about just how why we uh, put mulch in our gardens at home. We want to keep the soil moist, keep the water in there so it's not evaporating due to the um, sun radiation. Another point is that the wood mulch does not introduce the same weeds or invasive species that straw mulch does. So that's a big reason that we use, we're use we using wood mulch here. So should you be worried if mulch is dropped on or near your property? Um, first things first, there will be no mulch on your property without permission. So you'll be hearing from us. Um, if you haven't already, you'll be hearing from us shortly uh, if we're interested in putting mulch on your property. Um, this is a positive thing. We've had some questions from landowners that I just wanted to cover um, here. So uh, mulch is going to help if you have spread seed or planted seedlings on your property to try to aid in that regeneration. It's, it helps just like your garden, as I said, with moisture retention. And then another thing it does is it covers up the seeds, which reduces the likelihood for predation on those seeds, as it, um, which is pretty common if they're just exposed. The mulch is not gonna hurt any plants or seedlings that are revegetating naturally. Um, I like this photo we have of this little flower that's been mulched and um, it's doing just fine. The mulch didn't hurt it at all. So that's gonna be the case across different species. So our next steps um, are for the mulching is that we need to field verify that the conditions we've identified with this whole desktop assessment are accurate still on the ground. So what we're looking for is if there's a lot of rock or if there's a lot of natural regeneration, those are areas that we don't need to mulch because they're the mulch isn't going to be very effective. And the natural regeneration, if it's occurring on its own, we're happy to just leave it as it is. Um, and then meanwhile, we'll be generating those agreements with the Forest Service and the private landowners. Um, CPRW and Greeley are taking care of that piece. And our goal start date for mulching operations is June 1st, 2022. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to Shana from CPRW. 
All right. Thanks, Abby. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. Let me do a slide. Share my. And okay, are you all seeing the first slide? Perfect. Okay, well, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Shana Jones. I'm the post fire program manager for the Coalition for the Poudre River Watershed. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some projects that CPRW is leading uh, this year. Okay, so Jen gave us a good intro. Um, we're a nonprofit based in Fort Collins. Our mission is to improve and maintain the ecological health of the Poudre River watershed through community collaboration. So as Jen mentioned, we formed after the High Park fire. We're very involved in the recovery and restoration following that event. And for the Cameron Peak fire, as Jen mentioned, we've been coordinating a watershed specific group to collaborate on all the post fire projects. We've been helping lead field inspections for the mulching effort, which Abby just presented on, collaborating with Greeley and Larimer County on their EWP projects. We've also been spearheading several smaller scale post-fire water quality focused projects, and I'll talk a little bit about those next. And then additionally, we've been collaborating with several partners on a larger scale reforestation program, which I'll also briefly summarize. Okay. So we have funding for several projects from the Colorado Department of Health and Environment. And for those, those projects funded by CDPHE, the primary goal is to protect water quality in post-fire systems. So the grant funding requires quantitative assessment of sediment deposition and movement. Um, and in terms of treatments, they are similar treatments to those that Colin showed uh, earlier but they're sort of like smaller scale in comparison to those being used, say, in the EWP program. So we're not using heavy equipment for installation. Um, we're primarily using hand crews or groups like the Larimer County Conservation Corps or um, volunteers to install these types of treatments. So some examples are on the slide, um, similar to what Colin showed, but, but done with uh, volunteer or hand labor. Uh, so waddles, log jams, willow debris fences. Um, and again, the, the treatments are really intended to promote deposition and slow the pulse of sediment to streams, helping protect water quality. We've been really focused on some of the smaller tributaries so far, um, and we'll have a couple other projects this year. So um, in 2021, which you can see on the left, we installed treatments at five locations, which included the Sheep Creek, Norman Fry area, Little Beaver, Fish Creek, and the Upper South Fork Monument Gulch areas off of Pingree Park Road. For 2022, we are still in the process of verifying field conditions, but we're likely looking at another four to five projects. Um, we're looking at a couple locations uh, adjacent to the main stem of the Pooter. We're also looking in the Upper Black Hollow area, um, and again, the Monument Gulch Upper South Fork area. So um, we'll be determining the, the specific locations um, in those areas over the next uh, couple of weeks. We'll likely have additional projects in 2023, uh, depending on the progress that we make this year and the funding available. In terms of reforestation, um, we are um, working to reestablish tree cover where there's a lack of natural uh, regeneration and in areas that are too far from living trees to naturally recede. So um, on our reforestation program, we're working with a large group of partners. Um, you can see some of those logos on the left. And that this group's working together to identify planting areas, to fundraise, and to grow out seedlings. So collectively, the program's aiming to plant um, about 13,000 trees this year. I know the Forest Service is going to present in a bit, and they'll talk a little bit about reforestation efforts as well. Um, so these numbers are in addition to, to their, their goals and numbers. This is an ongoing effort, so we will have additional plantings in 2023 and beyond. The program's uh, primarily planting ponderosa pine, ponderosa pine, excuse me. Uh, project locations are considering um, 
We consider climate models, slope, access, um, contiguous acres to figure out the best places to plant. Um, we're focused on areas with high to moderate burn severity. And we're still in the process of determining locations in the pooter um, for 2022. So if folks listening tonight are interested in plantings, um, please do get in touch. We'll be primarily working with groups like the Larimer County Conservation Corps and corporate volunteer groups. Um, we have a bunch of those lined up to do some of the plantings in the pooter uh, so far. But there may be some additional volunteer opportunities. Um, and so if we have some of those and they become available, we'll post those on our website, newsletter, social media. And with that, this is my contact information. Um, please reach out if you have questions about any of our um, smaller scale water quality projects or the reforestation efforts. And I believe Will is next, so I will hand it over to him. Thank you, Shana. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen as well. All right, is everyone seeing that? Great. Okay, so thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Will Davis and I am the Communications and Outreach Manager with Big Thompson Watershed Coalition. Um, and like everyone else, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our 2022 work plans um, going into 2023 as well. Um, I wanted to give a little bit of background on Cameron Peak Fire in the Big T before I move into that. Uh, so on this map, you can just see the Big Thompson Watershed here. Uh, Big Thompson Watershed Coalition primarily works in the canyon down through Loveland, and then Estes Valley Watershed Coalition works around the Estes Park area. In this map, you can see how Cameron Peak Fire moved into the Big Thompson. Um, and so this was uh, this area was the lower area that Abby was showing earlier on her prioritization. Uh, in the Big T, Cameron Peak burned over uh, 64,000 acres, which included over 425 stream miles and over 16,000 acres of private lands. Um, and this map here is just showing all of the private lands that were affected in the Big T by Cameron Peak fire. And so down on our side of things, there's a really big need to balance um, private lands recovery, but also recognize that all of those lands and the watershed as well are impacted by all the public lands surrounding them. In 2021, uh, most of our focus was on private lands, but as we expand more aerial mulching and in-stream work this year and into next year, um, we will be doing more on public lands as well. So Big Thompson Watershed Coalition's role um, to date and going forward in post-fire recovery has been to work with private landowners on recovery, which has really been through three main uh, methods. One being providing trainings, educational resources, and materials. Uh, last year, we were able to host a few trainings and provide wattles and native seed to landowners. This year, we are looking to do uh, more native seed giveaways and are working to coordinate those right now. So stay tuned and follow us on social media, Facebook, um, if you want to stay up to date on when we can, when we can provide that native seed. Uh, in addition, we also host volunteer events on private lands. Uh, last year and this year, we We'll be doing erosion control days, installing wattles, spreading mulch and native seed. And then this year we'll also add reforestation to that as Shana was just talking about before that. And then lastly, um, we help to coordinate the work for other groups, uh, groups like Wildlands Restoration Volunteers, Larimer County Conservation Corps, Serve 6.8, who all have resources and the ability to also help private landowners. Uh, we look to help prioritize where they can do that work. Um, so all that will continue into 2022. Uh, in addition, we help to coordinate the aerial mulching efforts. So we work closely with um, Abby at JW, and this year it'll also be working closely with the city of Loveland, who will be our fiscal sponsor um, for the aerial mulching work. Uh, we'll work closely with Colin on the in-stream projects, and I'll talk a little bit more about some of the locations for that, but our goal is uh, largely to have all the locations prioritized and plans ready to go for implementation in 2023. Uh, and then lastly, what Big Thompson Watershed Coalition does is source funding for all these projects. Um, and this is working with a lot of partners to source this funding, but currently we have received funding from state and federal sources, county, city of Loveland, as well as local organizations like Community Foundation and United Way. Uh, for 2022, I'll talk a little bit about our aerial mulching plans and point mitigation plans. Um, sorry if there is any redundancy in what Abby was talking about earlier. 
but this is that final map that Abby showed of the prioritization of subwatersheds, and it's just on the Big T side this time. Uh, as you can see, right down the middle of the of the watershed that was affected by Cameron Peak Fire is where we're seeing the most uh, intense and severe soil burn severity. And so for area mulching efforts last year, we were able to complete just over 750 acres in the Miller Fork uh, area around the retreat community. This year, we currently have funding for about 1,100 more acres, um, and we're hoping to source more funding before the end of the year for that as well. So our priorities to start uh, with our current funding is to finish the Miller Fork area and then move up into the headwaters of Buckhorn Creek and Cascade Creek. Um, and just to orient you a little bit, this is right about uh, the Crystal Park area moving into Forest Road 129, Ballard and Greer Road um, right up here. If we are able to source more funding, we would like to move down into the Upper Sheep Creek area and potentially into Stringtown Gulch and Bear Gulch areas. Uh, it's very similar for the point mitigation. There is, we're in the very early phases of identifying the priority locations for that. So there definitely may be shifts at this point, um, but preliminary priority areas are the Big Bear area, Foggy Park Road, um, Stringtown and Moondance neighborhoods and Fish Creek, uh, going into Upper Sheep Creek, as well as um, Cascade Creek area. So those are some potential priority locations for the in-stream work, but as I said, shifts may happen as we uh, get on the ground and continue to uh, work with Ayers and Colin over there to prioritize those locations. For reforestation, uh, we're also looking at a lot of similar areas, but again, um, are in the early phases of prioritizing them. We did have our first, um, we coordinated wildlands restoration volunteers to do the first reforestation planning events in the Big T, and they were able to plant um, 1,200 trees in the Moondance neighborhood um, over last weekend. Uh, we hope to plant more trees in the Stringtown area and then move up into the upper Buckhorn area as well um, as those trees become available in the fall and Larimer County Conservation Corps um, is, is ready to plant them. And that is my updates and my time for everyone. Um, I appreciate everyone joining tonight and I'm happy to answer any questions um, when we do get to the Q&A section. And you can see that my contact information as well as the director of the organization, Laura Quattrini is, is right there on the slide. And with that, I will pass it off to Chris Stahl with the Forest Service. All right, thank you, Will. And good evening, everyone. Thanks for attending. I am Chris Dahl, um, Acting District Ranger for the Canyon Lakes Ranger District um, on the Arapahoe and Roosevelt National Forest. Pawnee National Grasslands um, comprises mostly the national forest lands in, in Larimer County. And so 90% of Cameron Peak, as, as Jen mentioned. Um, and I'm going to share my screen. OK. Um, and so there, there is a lot of overlap in, in the slides, um, and there's a lot of great information, and that, that's because we are working so closely together, um, and it's been awesome um, to just work with this group of collaborators. Um, so what I'll hit on is some of the accomplishments that, we ha that we've had since Cameron Peak, particularly in the season of 2021. Um, so the burned area emergency response, um, several folks have spoken to this, essentially that initial initial assessment and action taken to mitigate threats to life and property. And so in 2021, we treated 51 miles of Forest Service roads, um, lar largely contract work. Um, we've also treated 40 miles of trails. Um, a lot of that effort was from partners and the Larimer County Conservation Corps. And so um, thanks, thanks to them. Um, 119 miles of dozer line, um, bulldozer line that was created as part of the suppression effort during the Cameron Peak fire. Um, that was all repaired. Um, and let's see, next slide. Okay, and some other efforts that have that have gone on um, with a lot of help. Um, the Black Hollow flood was mentioned. There have been several cleanup events, um, two events in 2021. We've had one so far in 2022, just a couple weekends ago. Um, there have been over 150 volunteers. We've had the help from multiple groups and stakeholders and many of the people on the call tonight. Um, and we will we hope to have more as we work through the year because there's still definitely debris out there. Um, some of the stuff that's been pulled out um, has been pretty tricky. Um, propane tanks, um, lots of house de debris um, and other materials. And so it, it truly takes a lot of folks to do that activity as the 
the Poudre River is um, the only wild and scenic river in Colorado. So there's a lot of restrictions on what we can do and use um, to, to um, conduct activities in the river. And so an incredible effort there for some of the cleanups so far. Um, some of the work that, we'll, that we've been doing and we're gonna continue to do in 2021 is to identify and assess the, the road corridors um, and trails that are, that are contributing to the excess sedimentation. And you can see a, a prime picture of one um, that's really been torn up there on the screen. Um, essentially, we're gonna assess these for consideration of whether, they're, whether we need to do a full restoration um, or in some areas where we may need to do a reroute or close a road where a corridor just is no, is no longer feasible. Um, and so why are we doing the assessment still in 2022, right? The fire was in 2020. Well, there was a lot of damage that happened. This, this stuff primarily occurred from water erosion or water flow and erosion after the fire um, last summer. And so there's a lot of damage that occurred um, and we expect some more to occur um, this spring in areas that we weren't able to assess or mitigate. And so that's gonna be an ongoing effort um, some other things that we'll be doing, um, well, I mentioned multiple roads were stabilized during that, the, the BEAR, the Burned Area Emergency Response 2021. Um, there's a lot more to address in terms of that long-term recovery, and, and some of the efforts are, are going to include, um, you know, contrary maintenance of roads, um, but also replacement of culverts. Um, and in some cases, we'll be, we'll be assessing where, what's the size of that culvert? Should we upsize that for aquatic organism passage or just to allow um, more stream and sediment flow through there um, and less backing up. So there's less threat of damage um, to the infrastructure and overtop in the road. And so we're trying to take advantage of these opportunities um, to improve some of the infrastructure out there. So there's less risk in the future with some of these events. Um, forest revegetation has been mentioned. There's a lot on this slide. I hope you can see it. Um, but essentially there are a lot of trees that are gonna get planted over the next couple of years. Um, in, you know, I'd say about 11,000 acres were identified as unlikely to naturally revegetate within the burn area. Um, and that this is specifically on national forest system land. And um, there's about 600 acres that we've got planned for replanting this year. Um, tree species are gonna include um, Engelman spruce, lodgepole pine, limber pine, and ponderosa pine. Um, this effort's gonna continue with more planning in 2023. Um, I think we've got about 18,000 um, seedlings planned for this fall, um, and then another 56,000 um, seedlings that are being grown already um, that we're planning for planting in the spring of 2023. And some items to note too, um, all the seed is locally sourced um, from these areas, um, and it's gonna be planted in their appropriate zones as, as Shana described earlier. Um, I'd, I'd like to say thanks to all the partners, volunteers, collaborators, if we were relying solely on Forest Service funding and employees to manage the recovery, um, we would not be anywhere close or as far as we are right now. And, and the level of collaboration has been pretty amazing and it, it doesn't happen in too many places like it is right here. Or like it is right here. Um, and so um, with that, uh, thank you for attending. And I'm gonna pass you off to Stephen with Larimer County. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. All right, let me stop sharing, Stephen, sorry. I think I can take it over for you. Okay, if you can, go for it, please. Can everybody see my screen? Not yet. Uh oh, no. sorry. Hmm. Okay, there we go. You can see it now? Yes. Okay, okay. awesome. Thank you. All right, hi everyone. My name is Stephen Decatur. I'm with the Larimer County Office of Emergency Management. And I'm going to be talking about our work plans this year for 2022. Um, so a big thing that is ongoing currently, our engineering department is working on road link culverts in the burn area. Um, three culverts on Pingree Park Road are almost complete. Um, they're being upsized to accommodate larger flows um, within the burn area. Uh, County Road 69, the Swamp Creek culvert is complete. And then there's two on Seven Mile Creek. Um, that will break ground soon. Um, and that is expected, that work is expected to be going on during the summer. So there will be periodic road closures in that area. Um, and then Larimer, Larimer County, Laramie County River Road, um, that culvert should be completed in June. There's one culvert being replaced there. Uh, and then in the retreat, that um, road system was rebuilt. The pictures on the bottom of the screen are from the retreat area. Um, there was pretty massive damage over last summer from flooding post fire. 
Um, so that road had to be rebuilt um, along with some damage on 44H as well. Both those locations are mostly complete now. Um, if there is more damage that happens this year, obviously um, we'll request more funds from EWP, which is largely what's being used to um, fund these projects, at least partially fund them. Um, so that is a possibility for this year. Our engineering department is also working on structure protection for homes. Um, those areas where we're focusing on are the Lazy D area, the Rustic area, the Retreat, and Buckhorn areas. Um, and we will see some structure protection work um, beginning for interested property owners at risk. Um, and that will begin in May, and we're hoping to have that wrapped up by August 31st. Um, if you believe your home is at risk in one of those areas, um, feel free to reach out to Morgan Fay with our engineering department, um, and she will be able to provide you with some more information, and they might be able to come out and look at it. Um, I will drop her email in the chat for you as well um, so that you have it. So let me put that in there. All right. So another thing that's gonna be happening on um, this summer is we will be sending out sandbags here soon. Um, we are partnering with Serve 6-8, a nonprofit group. They are currently filling sandbags at the Foundation Church area in Loveland. Um, they plan to do 135 pallets of sandbags this year, uh, which is less than last year, but still a significant amount. Uh, we are gonna be delivering those um, in mid uh, to late May to 15 different locations throughout the burn area. Um, those have already been decided, and I will share that location with you in the chat as well. I'm surprised I'm so good at multitasking right now. Um, so there is the map location there. You can click that link, and that'll show you where those sandbag pallets will be delivered. If your area is not going to be getting sandbag pallets and you need some, you are able to pick them up at Foundations Church. They ask that you fill out this form. I'm dropping it in the chat right now. Um, to request those sandbags and they'll reach out to you about when you can pick those up. Um, so that is an option for you as well if there's aren't gonna be any deliveries near your area. Um, and then if you have any questions about that, you can also contact me as well and I'll happily connect you to the right person. All right, so let's see, next slide. Sorry, so many windows open on my computer right now. All right, um, so another thing that's gonna be happening this year, we will be doing some private property tree removal in partnership with the Long-Term Recovery Group and the Larimer County Conservation Corps. So the Long-Term Recovery Group case manages for the fire. Um, they help um, pe connect people to resources and help those that need it most. Um, and so they have been working to identify um, property owners that need assistance um, and don't have the means to do that work on their own for uh, hazard tree removal on their properties, private property tree removal. Um, and so they'll be, they'll be working with the Larimer County Conservation Corps this summer to cut those trees and chip them and broadcast those trips on chips back onto the property. Um, and again, this is, Larimer County is just supporting, um, but this is really going to be done with the Larimer County Conservation Corps and the Long-Term Recovery Group. If you do believe that you're, that um, you want to be considered for this, um, there's still a little bit of time to get on their list and you should reach out to Ben. I just dropped his email in the chat um, and he will work with you to see if they can get you on their list for work this year. Um, we also have a monthly um, or bi-weekly newsletter. It kind of depends on how much is going on with the fire this year. If it gets really busy um, during recovery in the midst of summer, we might go to bi-weekly, um, but otherwise it'll be a monthly newsletter. Um, if you want to be included on this newsletter so you get the latest updates of what's going on in the fire area, please reach out to me. Again, I dropped my email in the chat um, just up there, uh, just before Ben's, it's uh, DECA or D-E-C-A-T-U-S-A -D -E at co.larimer.co.us, and I will put you on that email list. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention that there's some general mitigation work happening outside the fire area with some co-swap grant funding um, that has kind of resulted from the fire. Um, so there is some money that's out now, um, and this is to um, protect unburned areas um, from the potential of wildfire in the future. Um, we're putting in applications for Pole Hill, Waltonia, and the Cherokee Park area. Um, and then Larimer County also did a pilot program for a community mitigation grant program this year. We had 16 applications requesting over $200,000. Um, for this first year, and we were able to award um, only for $50,000, um, we were able to at least partially fund eight applications, and some of those were in the burn area um, and are going to be assisting with some recovery mitigation work. If you have questions about that grant program, 
um, feel free to reach out to me and I can definitely put you on a list um, to get next year's notification if uh, assuming it gets funded again with Larimer County. And that is all I have. And so I will go ahead and pass this on to uh, Steve Griffin. Wonderful, thank you. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. And thank you, Stephen. Um, I'm with Colorado Department of Transportation. I am the region four hydraulic engineer. So we cover uh, Northern Colorado and Eastern Colorado. I will go ahead and share my screen. And I believe I am the last uh, presentation. So I will keep this uh, fairly brief. And hopefully everyone is seeing my um, presentation here. Um, so our plans in the Colorado uh, 14 Poudre Canyon for this spring and summer, I've listed four locations here on your screen. Uh, those of you I know residents of the canyon are probably pretty familiar with this numbering. Those that may not be as familiar, uh, the numbering in the Poudre Canyon uh, is lowest the further west you go. So Cameron Peak is around milepost 62 and the town of Rustic is in the low 90s. So uh, they decrease as you head west. So um, going in order from east to west, milepost 87, um, you should expect to see some culvert upsizing at that location and some traffic control here, probably not for another couple months yet. The milepost 85.9 site, which is Washout Gulch, that's actually under construction right now. So if you drive up the canyon, I actually just drove up there on Monday and the traffic control is in place there. Uh, we have a shoe fly detour around the site. So it's one one way traffic and we have um, traffic control during the day directing that traffic. And at nighttime, we have an automated traffic light. Um, that'll be going for about a month. We anticipate that to wrap up here. Let's see, it's the end of April. So probably by the end of May, that, that site will be more or less wrapped up. Milepost 84.8, we actually don't have a culvert at this location currently, and we are going to install one. Um, you should expect that one sometime later this summer. And then milepost 76, which is near the Tunnel Creek crossing, will be upsizing a uh, side tributary of Tunnel Creek um, as it crosses 14. So that's for this summer. We have a number of other locations that we're looking at down the, down the road, as it were, for next summer of 23. But for right now, we're really just going to highlight what's going on right now and for the next couple of months in terms of traffic impacts. Um, those of you that may have live up the canyon or uh, were, were present for some of the um, events from last spring and summer, you, you saw this. And this is from one of the slides. This is actually the same night as the, um, the Black Hollow incident. And that's Rocky Winters there in our, in our loader trying to clear the, the path there at milepost 87 to get rid of some of the debris that came down that drainage there. So this is one of the four locations I just mentioned. Um, our goal with these projects, you know, we try to be realistic with these. It's not necessarily to completely prevent uh, any and all traffic impacts when these debris slides happen. It's, it's of such an unpredictable nature. Our goal is, is really to minimize those traffic impacts, obviously to, to keep the first responders safe, to keep the residents in the canyon and those who are traveling through the canyon safe, to, to try to be as proactive as possible in road closures. And um, towards that end, as I say, the highest priority is to keep the traveling public and first responders safe. That's really our, our ultimate goal here. Um, we're on highest alert during that monsoon season, which uh, typically goes from May to September. If the patterns are anything like we saw last year, um, it was really the end of June through the month of July and into that first week of August where we saw debris slides impacting State Highway 14. Most of those closures were a day or less. Um, the, the night of Black Hollow was the most significant traffic impact that we had up there, which was uh, the end of July. But that we're on really alert starting in May and going through September, um, that's the, the, the time of highest risk for this corridor. What we saw last year, half inch to an inch per hour of, in, of intensity is really about all it took for some of these slides to come down. Um, as I mentioned, we have an emergency action plan in place for the State Highway 14 corridor. Colorado State Patrol, CDOT maintenance, Rocky, uh, living so close to, to the maintenance yard up there is very tuned in to what goes on. Um, obviously, Larimer County is heavily involved with that plan as well. We also have a direct line with the National Weather Service in Boulder 
Um, we've got some remote monitoring that we've been installing with cooperation from Larimer County as well that we're going to be um, keeping very close tabs as we get into May, June, July, and August. Um, and finally, uh, this is actually an aerial view from two days ago of the 85.9 Washout Gulch site. And uh, that's what it looks like from high up. You can see there the, the detour in place and the heavy equipment that, uh, that's there. Um, again, my name is Steve Griffin. I'm the hydraulic engineer for Northern Colorado for CDOT. Uh, Justin Pipe, who is not with us this evening, but he is our resident engineer. And you see his contact information hopefully on your screen as well. And both of us are available for any, um, any questions or concerns. And with that, I believe I am the last presentation. So I'll turn it back over to our host. Great, thank you. Thank you to all of our presenters. Um, we uh, have some time left if you wanna stick around for questions. Um, so please feel free to put questions in the chat and we will um, get to those right now. You're also welcome to unmute yourself if you want to just ask the question. <laughs> all right, I'm shocked there's no questions after all of that information, but if not, um, no worries, you have um, contact information um, that was presented and in the chats. Um, I will post um, the recording. Um, Sue Schneider wants to thank everyone. Um, and I was just about to say after I post this recording, thank you so much. The collaboration, as you can see, that has gone on here is incredible. Um, and it's a huge undertaking, but um, it's, it's so great to work with all these amazing partners. Um, so, yes, definitely share this video with your friends and neighbors if they are at all wondering what we have planned for um, this year. And thank you all for being here. Have a great night. Go Nuggets. Thanks so much, everyone.